Hi everyone, welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. Today's video is an interview I did last week with Mary Kahn. Mary was featured in Season 1, Episode 3 of Scientology in the Aftermath. I had announced that we were going to do this interview in the supporters of Leah Remini Facebook group and I um, solicited questions and I was intending to do this interview with Mary as a Q&A. But we spent so much time just talking about the OT levels and her experience on the OT levels uh, that we didn't get around to actually asking the questions that were submitted for the Q&A. So what we decided to do is that for anyone who actually sticks through and watches this whole interview, we wanted to address any questions that were still remaining based on what we discuss. And so if you watch this video all the way through, throw your questions down in the comments section below and Mary and I will do a follow-up interview and it'll be more of a Q&A. So that leads me to my first plug, which is if you are not already a member of the supporters of Leah Remini Facebook group, definitely check it out. Uh, the contributors of Scientology in the Aftermath answer your questions about Scientology and about the show and about life after Scientology, and uh, you might enjoy it. Second plug that I want to make, please don't forget on March 10th, we are having a giant Scientology in the Aftermath meetup in downtown Clearwater on the 400 block and 500 block of Cleveland Street. If you're anywhere near Tampa Bay, please come on over and join us. All are welcome and it's going to be a fantastic time. I will post a link to the Facebook event page for the meetup in the description below. All right, that's all the plugs I have. Here's my conversation with Mary. Hope you guys enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. We are chatting today with Mary Kahn. Hi, Mary. Hi, Aaron. Is that loud enough? <laughs> <laughs> that is loud enough. Uh, okay, thanks for taking the time and doing this today. I really appreciate it. Sure. I'm happy so, to be here. Um, all right. So, so many places we can begin. I would like to chat with you about your experience doing the OT levels as a public Scientologist, but I know a lot of people watching um, probably haven't really heard anything from you since the episode aired. Have you done any interviews or anything um, publicly? I yeah, I did an interview with uh, Chris Crimey. Come get some. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you did the podcast. Yeah, the podcast. I think yeah. most of my viewers probably um, aren't familiar with that podcast. I'm going to guess. Yeah. Um, but uh, and so, what did you guys talk about mostly on that podcast? You know, um, I really don't quite remember. It was just a general thing. I don't remember talking about OT levels. I do remember saying I didn't have much hope that I would, uh, I'm not sure I said that. I didn't have much hope about the church losing its tax exempt status. I believe I said that. I don't, I just think the church is gonna fade away. I think uh, David, Mis do you mind if I just free associate here? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. I just think David Miscavige is going to do what LRH did. He's going to look out for his legacy because otherwise he's going to be known as a piece of shit. Because imagine if he stepped off and somebody stepped in and said, let's just hypothetically say it was um, Hubbard's, Diana Hubbard. And she went, okay, all SP declares are revoked. There's been too much crap going on. All SP declares are revoked. He's going to prevent that from happening. So I think he's going to set somebody up that's as much of an asshole as he is. And not that Diane is not. I don't even know her, but I was just being hypothetical. Um, and then make sure that he can still um, control things like Hubbard did, have a few things to say, make sure that the troops are in line and step off into oblivion. And it won't actually end and until it ends, until they run out of money. <laughs> so if he stepped off, um, kind of moved off the lines the way L. Ron Hubbard did, what would be his excuse for why it was necessary? Because Hubbard's excuse was he needed to move off and finish up his OT research before he dropped his body this lifetime. What would Miscavige's excuse be? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm sure he'll think of something. It's amazing what the sheeple will buy. It's totally amazing. But I think he's gonna want to um, enjoy uh, his 
money and whoever he's going to bring with him. And, uh, but I don't think he's going to step off for at least 10 years. What is he, 55? Yeah, I'd have to Google it, but it's somewhere like it's it's somewhere around there. Yeah, I don't think he'll step off for for ten years or so. Not on, I you know I don't know. Wouldn't it be fun to uh, see him actually have to be deposed or? But I just um, don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, he's fifty seven. Um, I agree with you in that um, I don't think anybody in the U.S. government has the political balls um, to invest, I should say they don't have enough political capital to invest into the process of trying to get Scientology's tax exemption revoked. It's my personal opinion. Um, I, as far as see, see, things like this, I don't think it's necessary or responsible to say whether it will or will not happen. It, it's enough to say likelihood. Because I worry that when I say things like, I don't think the government's gonna revoke the tax exempt status, I worry that some people will interpret that to mean I don't think it's worthwhile to try. Right. And I do think it's worthwhile to try. I just think it's highly unlikely that that will be the outcome. Um, but I also follow that up by saying, I don't think it's necessary. You don't have to revoke the tax exempt status in order to ensure the eventual demise of the Church of Scientology. The Church of Scientology is doing, has been doing it to itself since the early right. 90s. Right. And I think it's an irreversible trend. I don't think the Church of Scientology can pull out of the nosedive that it's in. Um, right. But... Uh, and and I try to explain to people also that when you have as much property as the church has, and when it's tax exempt, they don't pay property taxes. Uh, they don't have mortgages. All these properties are owned outright. You could nail shut all of the doors to the churches of Scientology today, and the interest earned on the church's current reserves would be enough to pay the utility bills and the insurance there's no reason for the physical entities associated with the churches of Scientology to go away. Right. But would, but the influence that it has continues to get less. Um, the membership that it has continues to get less. Its reputation has never been worse. So the right. church of Scientology is really destroying itself. Right. Yeah. What do you think? Let me ask you a question. Hypothetically speaking, sometimes I think, gosh, I, I, although I know David Miscavige is just nuts. I mean, he's a black soul. But I thought, what would I do if I were him to try to make myself look better, uh, reverse this downward trend? Um, and I thought, I would say, I've been looking over all these SP declares, and it's a mess. How many good people have been erroneously declared. So I'm revoking all SP declares. People in the church would think he was the best thing since sliced bread. I've already heard comments from people thinking he's already done a better job than LRH did. I think the people in the church would think that was so applaudable. It, I mean, for lack of a better way of putting this, everybody would blow down. Um, and then, of course, you and I and uh, people that have lost loved ones and friends would think, wow, maybe this means we actually will see them again. I think it would reverse it. I think it would stop. So it would stop anybody from speaking out. It would stop any more documentaries. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. So again, the big, the, the thing that question hinges on is what would you do if you didn't have all of the psychoses <laughs> or whatever that David Miscavige has, or if you weren't trying to protect the secrets that David Miscavige was trying to protect, right. um, it would be a piece of cake. I, like, okay, I would, if I were him and I were going to do what you just said, I would position it a little differently. I, uh, he could either review it all and say, we reviewed this and th this has been a huge mistake, or he, he could position it otherwise. Do you remember where LRH said things like, oh no, we have the tools to fix suppressive people. We're just not going to bother getting around to them until we've helped everyone else because they're, they've been working, they've been working so hard to make our jobs difficult. We're not going to bother with those pieces of shit until they're, they're the last ones. You remember he said things like right. that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So all Miscavige would have to do is say, okay, well, up until now, based on LRH's instructions, we have been protecting the comm lines of the communication lines of Scientology by declaring these people who've been acting against us and making sure, you know, disconnecting them from the operations of Scientology. But now, since we've achieved such amazingly fantastic expansion thresholds, we are now stable enough and secure enough and strong enough that we are willing to, um, to basically undeclare these people so that we can begin the process of helping them as well. And so, right, so essentially use that as a justification for an amnesty. Right. And then he could he could still come along and then redeclare people who continue to attack. Like, like if he did that, like if he gave everyone the amnesty, he would show everyone that he was genuine and now wanting to help everyone and reconnect right. families. And then he could make people re-earn their SP declares. <laughs> right. And just to reiterate that it was these people who were intent on destroying Scientology, despite our best efforts. Right. Now, let me be clear on something. By undeclaring people, the way I'm thinking about that, it doesn't mean all those people go back into Scientology. Right. It just means undeclaring them so that the current Scientologists aren't statutorily prevented from talking to their family members. Right. So he would basically be giving everyone who was declared an opportunity to reconnect with their family members, but not to talk shit about Scientology. That's right. Hey, I offered that. <laughs> I, in my ambushed comment, I said, listen, just do a non-attribulation order on me. My son and my husband can do what they want. I will never speak out again. Just leave me the fuck alone. I just right. wanted out. Right. I wasn't going to swear. Shoot. Okay, take out the fuck. No, no, we can swear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, now they're doing that. Now they're actually, uh, I have advised people that have been called in. Whatever you do, don't go in. Just don't go in. Don't play by their rules. And these people have not been declared. And they just keep their mouth shut. And they're not, there's no pictures of them with Mike Render. They don't go to any of the parties or whatever. And they're not declared. It's true. And look, there's two different schools of thought on this subject. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, you can do what you just said, which is you can walk away quietly from Scientology and keep your mouth shut and don't say anything to anyone and don't associate with any big, bad, suppressive people. And you will be able to continue having a relationship with your family. And on a case-by-case -case basis, that's up to every individual person. And I would never hold that against someone for choosing that route. But on the other hand, you can make the argument that everyone agreeing to keep their mouths shut um, for the purpose of um, uh, basically succumbing to the blackmail that otherwise, if you do, you're going to lose your family. Right. That that kind of complacency is what allows abuses like this to keep happening over the generations. Right. And both of those statements are true. I just, I can't personally hold it against someone for deciding that what they want for themselves is just to move on with their lives and keep their relationship with their family. And, 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 and that will be good enough for them. On a personal level, I, I think that decision is fine. As on a macro level, that is problematic in the sense that it allows the abuses to occur. But what can I say? Some people are going to make that decision and some people are going to, some people are going to make the decision to, to just keep their mouth shut and some people are going to make the decision to speak out and it, it's whatever is right for the person. Right. Well, I'm not as magnanimous as you. Even though I said that to them at the time, I, I was still pretty messed up in my head, really messed up. And uh, I just wanted my family. And that's, I, you know, I was basically begging. I mean, I, it felt like selling my soul. It felt like it. And you are. Um, but that's what was going on at the time. Now, having been out many years now, I'm actually gotten to the point where I'm pissed off about, I, I have people that, that talk to me that, um, I know one person that's never been a Scientologist, but her family is. She um, hates Scientology. But she, you know, really has to toe the line because she doesn't want to 
go through the discomfort that it, and the upheaval that would take place if she, in fact, I've seen it happen already where um, she would like a few things that I posted on Facebook. She stopped altogether. And I know that's her family. S somebody got on her family and her family got on her. So, and she, who, if they're watching right now, they know who I'm talking about. That's somebody that's never been in. You know, I'm irritated with people like this. I, I have somebody else, Mary, I know I disconnected from you. I'm really sorry. I had to do that. It's my family. It really pisses me off because like you said, if everybody that was sick of this church and, and let's just say the disconnection policy stood up and said, no, it would be over tomorrow. Totally. <laughs> totally. There's, there's what they, they are what's keeping it going. It's true. It's true. And even though I agree with that intellectually, um, you know, I myself was under the radar for so many years for the only reason of my family, my wife's family, my job. Now, but I guess where it was a little different is that I was putting I was putting forth a public appearance of still being a Scientologist or you know still a good being a good Scientologist. Right. Um, but where, whereas I was in touch with Mike, I was in touch with Marty, I was in touch with Dan Kuhn, and you I was in touch with your mom. Right, right. Oh, yeah. So I, I didn't really disconnect. Oh, so yeah, that's different than what you're talking about as well. I pretended to be disconnected from my mom and um, pretended that I wasn't in touch with Mike and Marty so that I could maintain the status quo of my life at that right. time. Um, but, but I was being true to myself right. in the sense that I wasn't turning my back on, on the people that I was pretending right. to be disconnected from. I was only pretending. Right. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I, there's a lot. Okay. So I guess we're talking about two different things. You're talking about someone who actually disconnects from you out of fear. And I guess I was talking about people who stay under the radar, but, uh, but sort of pretend. No, I guess you're right. Cause these people still talk to me, but not mm. out in the open. Right. Okay. So you're saying, but even that is an example of what allows the abuses to keep happening. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, that's, that's all there's, believe me, I know that I was part of that group. I was part of that group for years, but I've had a horrible, uh, time just trying to unravel from the mess and so many one, what ifs, what if, what if I would have stopped doing Scientology when I was really, kind of done with it it would have been over i mean none of this would have happened because your son would have been too young to even be involved yeah he, he never would have been involved um yeah so anyway the, the what ifs can go all the way back to my childhood you know <laughs> what if i would have had a better childhood and not got you know just so the what if game is an exercise in futility. Yeah, true. How long were you under the radar ish? And like, what did that mean for you? Well, um, I guess there's various points, but the point where, and this was a question I saw when, when did I actually, when was it actually, that's it. Some, some question like that. Um, I was, I got back on OT7 in 2005 and it was awful, horrible, because I don't know if everybody knows this, but I did OT7 in 85 or 86, 86. It took me six months. It was pretty easy peasy. I actually kind of liked it. Um, no sex checking. Uh, Okay, fast forward to 2005, and I avoided getting back on, on OT7 from 96 on. And uh, so I got back on it in 2005. Um, and it, that's another question like that I could answer, but I'm gonna answer what I was uh, going for to begin with, which is when was the first 
when was it over for me? When it was really over was uh, two th I, I put up with all this shit from 2005 to 2009. All these six month sex checks, over the top sex checking. Um, I mean, honestly, it, and here's another subject I wanna to touch on if you wanna make a note. The mental abuse of sex checking. Um, and you're the only one I've heard bring that up. But anyway, so all this sex checking, all this, find, I found out later, padded programs that you don't need. It's all for the money, money, money. At the time, you don't know that. I'm just rolling with it. I hate it, but rolling with it. It wasn't OT7 per se that I didn't like. It was all that other shit. Having your life micromanaged knowing i mean even when you're out for people that don't know ot7 you basically are at home you're not in the org all the time you're at home people are all over the planet various places and then they have to go into flag every six months and get what's called a refresher but it's sec checking to make sure you've been good well in that time period you're basically monitoring yourself it's such a mind fuck it's like, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this, don't say this. Don't think this. Just because it's going to come up in your sex check. Oh, my God. It's just absolutely horrendous. That didn't do it. But I'm, you know, it's, it's weighing on me. What really was the no turning back, I'm done with this fucking church, was 2009 when I was, uh, I was done. I had the same meter phenomenon go on that happened in 86, 87. I knew I was done and I was called in to complete. And I was like, on so many, for so many reasons, I was like, yeah, I'm almost done with this level. Yeah, I was like the cockadoodle do, you know, I'm gonna get in there and it's gonna be easy peasy like it was in 86 or 87. So easy to finish it, you just went in, they do a like a minor little sec check, check things, you attest, that's it. Uh-uh. I go in, I'm thinking everybody's gonna be like, oh Mary, oh yeah, she's gonna finish. Wow, you know, and yay, look at Mary, and she's gonna finish. No, I go in and what do I get? A fucking sec check that so cold cocked me, I was on my ass. It was on something that I'd already been over so many times. Um, and, and in fact, been over so many times that I was promised I would never be sex checked on it again. This was not the first time I had been sex checked on it again. Here it was again. And it was just, um, and even, I mean, I was in tears the whole time to the point where then the auditor just, the auditor knew she just finished me. You could tell she was just, when auditor wants to get you through things, they'll get you through it. That auditor got me through it real fast, but I'm still doing lower conditions. This is another very punitive measure um, that I had had it on doing lower conditions. And, um, but I'm going through the motions and then I have to go before, the, they didn't even put me on the completion line. They were routing me back on to go home and continue auditing. Mm. And so I end up, before they route, route me back out, then I was in qualifications division, which is corrections. Um, and I'd never had this happen before, but it was sort of like, so you're not gonna behave like this anymore, are you? It was like a shame, shame, paper shame way that I was treated and it was so demeaning. So um, let me ask you a question real quick. So you think you're coming into the base to a test. Yeah. They start you on a sec check and then the lower conditions are started based on what comes up in your sec check or they just decided yeah. you were in lower conditions? No, it was- When you arrived. On, on what other piece of morsel they could get off of sec checking me mm. on this thing. And even my MAA, the, you know, the ethics terminal was, okay, Mary, so we're gonna have to do lowers. I mean, she was even like, you could tell. 
<laughs> she was like, oh, right. No. So then were you told originally that the reason you were coming into the base was to attest or you just like, what, here's what I'm saying. Did they specifically call you into the base premeditated, know that they're going to give you a sec check on this and that was never to attest? Um, I think it was to attest, but first they were going to throw in this sec check. Oh. And the sec check was such a dog's breakfast that they really didn't have any choice but to send me back home again. It was wow. a mess. It was a mess. But after that, I came home and, you know, I'm still trying to work things out in my head, but I was so, you know, it, it was the point where I guess all, from a very young age, I learned how to persevere. And basically since 2000, I just persevered through shit. 2005, persevered. And I'm still thinking, okay, this is over. I'll get, I'll start, you know, solo auditing on seven, get back. I just couldn't. I was flattened. It was like, it was like I had no choice beyond that. I was just flattened. I remember it was around Mother's Day. I was walking around like a zombie. It, it just, I cannot describe the mind fuck I went through after that. It just was horrific. And then finally, two weeks of just walking around like dazed, um, I just wrapped all my materials up, sent them in, said, I can't do this. And then I went in and they actually did put me on the comp line. And that was on <laughs> <laughs> and then, once you try to quit they're like okay okay you can be done oh my god i don't think any psychologist on this planet could unravel the fucked up head that i had from that but um i uh so i went into but he, here's another so that answers that question but this kind of brings me to another question a lot of people want to know about OT8 and what it was like on the ship. And all I want to say was the precursor to how horrible it was on the ship was already how horrible it was at Flag. Being on seven, getting through that comp line was a nightmare, a nightmare. I honestly, and people are doing it. There's three s steps to it. I don't remember them in particular, but basically for me, and I think for many, many people in this era, I don't know what it's like now. Maybe they've lightened up. It is like getting a rectal exam constantly. Um, and it's so, to me, demeaning. Like you have to prove your contributions, prove your participation, prove your squeaky clean. It's, it's really so degrading, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. It, and all I'm trying to do is persevere and get through this. Now, they kept me on the base. So that was probably June. From June, I didn't actually attest till October. And they kept me on the base that I was falling off that complex because I was so fucked up. Honestly, I'm trying to finish this level, but I was really messed up. So messed up from their shit. So they bring you in to finally go through the completion line after you send your materials in and say, I'm done. Then it's a four month process for you. And then they do attest you to completing OT7 after that, after all that. Because I jumped through their hoops. And I, when I turned in my materials, I didn't say, I'm not, I'm done. I just said, I can't do this. I couldn't audit myself. I couldn't do anything. I, I was see. Just, yeah. so they, they probably treated that as a sign of overrun, not a sign of you leaving Scientology, but that as, as a sign that you've overrun OT7 probably. As a uh, sign said, that somebody handled something wrong, you know, whatever. Right. You know, so they probably, I don't quite remember, cleaned up the ARC break. Um you know, to the point where then they put me on the comp line. But then, it, it, and just to show you the mind fuck, is that at one point on one of the steps that I fell off of, like I 
couldn't get through it. They bought up this same subject matter on in a sec check. Now, it, what maybe it wasn't that they brought it up. It was just that I was so fucked up about this subject being brought up that I can't help it. It's like the pink elephant in the room. Like, don't bring that up again, you know? And so then my auditor says to me, well, you know, in order for something to persist, it must contain a lie. That's an LRH datum. So now I'm thinking, so what am I lying about? And I'm just like, oh my God, this is why I am so adamant about this religion should not have any tax exempt status. And if it does, don't get in it and do what I did because you're going to do mental damage to yourself if you go through the machinations that I went through to make things work out mentally and then to come unravel from that. It's just, it's been, it's been hard, <laughs> you know, but you got to get out to unravel from it. It's, right. it's, so you know what I mean? You know, LRH datums will hook you, you know, and things like that. And that auditor saying that to me was like, okay, so what am I leaving out? And you just, ugh, anyway. Yeah, there's all sorts of key LRH datums that any recruiter or registrar or director of processing can use to handle you on any particular thing. So the one you mentioned, for anything to persist, it must contain a lie, is a perfect one. There's another one. There's another one. <laughs> injecting, injecting time into the decision-making process uh, validates the physical universe. <laughs> so if you have to, right, 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 right. You, you have to think about whether you're going to buy this next auditing package. Injecting time into it validates the physical universe. Right. Right. You don't need time. Yeah. Time is a consideration. That's that's another example of one. Yeah. But but right. Mary, when, when you said the completion line, uh, the completion line was pure hell. What does the completion line consist of? What is it about this that makes it pure hell? Well, first of all, anybody that's been on OT seven any length of time, I was only out the second time. This is short, four years. Most people are on it longer than that. Five, oh, six, most people on it for like 10 years. Yeah. Um, most people, most people, I think all people, once they get on seven, all they want to do is finish it. That's it. That's their big win is finishing seven. That's all you hear about when you go in. You're six months, I just want to finish seven. You know, that's the big win from seven is finishing it. So that, first of all, there's that. You just want to be done with having to go home, audit four to six sessions, come in every six months, pay a buttload of money to get sec check to make sure you're good. Your people are so done with that. It's, it's because it's mentally abusive because you've agreed to this spiritual sodomizing every six months when basically people are good. You know, and you're asked the same stupid questions or going over stupid little infractions that you've done over the past six months that they make big deals out of. Anyway, so that's why. That's the first reason that it, it makes it horrible is because you want so badly to be done. You want so badly not to fall off this comp line and be sent home again. So you have this stress of that. I was at one point toward the very end of that, I was staying at the base and I had an ice pack on my neck all the time sleeping, just all the time or when I would rest because I was so, so stressed out. And I thought it was because I have arthritis in my neck and it, and my CS thought that, I mean, I had a springy, people springy aren't gonna FN. understand. Yeah, springy FN, springy FN is an indication of withholds. And I, I was so uptight that, I mean, it was really hard to FN anything. 
And um, my auditor, I mean, I'm sorry, my CS, my case supervisor said, well, it's probably because of menopause. So they're already thinking of unusual solutions for me. It truly was because I had withholds. Because if somebody would have sat me down and said, and I could freely talk, I would have been going, blah, 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 and furthermore, and furthermore. But you're not allowed to at that point. You're not, nobody, you get to a point where you're not allowed to speak your truth. So yeah, the, that needle phenomenon was actually correct. But at the time, my CS and me and my auditors all believed it was a, a, a menopausal symptom. Right. So you're on OT7. Uh, for some of the, I think most people watching probably have already um, understood what's on the OT levels enough to, to know about body things and stuff. But for any, any who um, aren't fully familiar with what we're talking about, on OT3, you learn that what's really wrong with everyone on this planet is they have tons, thousands, and hundreds of thousands of spirits stuck to them. And I'm just giving a simple explanation here, Mary. And so on OT3, you do certain auditing processes to get rid of these thetans that are stuck to you. And then on OT4, you learn, oops, there's more. And you get rid of more of them. And then on OT5, you're like, oops, there's still more. And you get rid of more it's of them. It's just a different technology to get rid of them. Right. And on OT6 is just a, a, the, a course where you learn how to audit yourself on OT7. And then on OT7, you're like, oops, there's more. Except on OT7, not only are you <laughs> <laughs> on OT7, not only are you auditing the rest of your body things, but you can audit other people's body things and body things in the environment and stuff like that. So on OT7, Mary said this earlier in the video. You're basically at home, wherever you live, wherever your home city is. You're doing a six auditing sessions, short auditing sessions per day on yourself to get rid of more of these body things. And every six months, you have to go back to flag and get a security check, which is basically an interrogation. Um, okay, I just wanted to quickly explain that. So, Mary, when you were on OT7, you were taught, you were you alluded about 10 minutes ago to the fact that in between these six-month checks, in Scientology, they call them six-month checks or refreshers, you're constantly self-censoring you know, censoring yourself, like, don't do this, don't think this, because it's going to come up in your sec check, right? So you're, you're being extra, extra good because you're paranoid about not wanting to spend a lot of money on a sec check, on your sec check every six months. And then you go and get a sec check, and you still end up getting raked over the coals, despite all this self-censoring that you're having to do all the time. Right. Is that pretty much... The, the essence of what you're talking about as far as the stress, right? the constant stress, and then you get to flag and the constant stress of, am I going to be done by the time I leave here? Am I not going to be done? Is, is that most of where the stress is coming from or were there other things as well? No, that's most of where the stress was coming from for me. And I have to say, um, I know that um, some people think, God, how could she be on that level? You know, and how, you know, why did I agree to do this? Uh, you know, I'm sure there's many answers to that that I haven't even figured out yet. Um, but first of all, I didn't want to get back on seven to begin with, but it wasn't awful for me. Now, my husband was on it for 20 years and he never liked it. So what wasn't I, awful for you? Seven. Oh, just seven. the process of auditing OT7 was not yeah, all. and I'll tell you why. Because it's so funny to me that you talk to people that are out. I haven't talked to one person that's out that actually believes OT3, that did OT3. And um, I didn't believe it. In fact, you know, I, I was raising hell in the classroom, and I was kind of... Ugh. And they had to take me out of the classroom and the supervisor said, just apply the technology of it. So Mary, do you mean you haven't spoken to anyone who's out who still believes OT3 or you haven't spoken to anybody who's out who, when they read OT3 in Scientology, believed it? I haven't talked to anybody that's out that still believes it. Okay. Some people I talked to when they first got out did believe it. And then now they don't. So what about you? What, what, what happened when you read it for the first time? 
I just couldn't believe it. I thought it was nonsense, nonsense to the nth degree. It was like, wasn't just a little bit of nonsense. It was like, what? Ah! And I kind of was like that in the classroom, like, and then the supervisor pulled me out of the classroom because as you know, part of the trappings of Scientology is that you can't talk about your disagreements, your case. So not only do you keep things to yourself, so, so you don't know everybody else is going, what? This is horse. You know? <laughs> but you can't, I so badly want to look at the guy next to me and go, are you buying this? Are you, me? you know, and I'm sure he did too. You know, imagine what would happen to OT3 if you were allowed to be that open about it. People would clear the course room. <laughs> this tacit agreement concept is what keeps so many people in. Because everybody in thinks everybody is, oh, look at, look at that great person. Now she's OT3. Wow, I just didn't, something. Yeah, you know, my husband was talking to his auditor and said, you know, I'm not sure I believe this OT3. He was telling me the story. And the auditor said, that's part of the trap of OT3. Oh, of you don't course. believe it. So then you go, oh, okay. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, they had to pull me out of the course room and the, the supervisor just said, just apply the technology of it. So he and basically course, said, it doesn't like matter that you don't believe it. Carry on. Right. And nowhere ever did anybody then say, so do you believe it now? They just say, apply the technology of it. And I'm sure, you know, the meter phenomenon complements the technology of it. And, um, and then I think for me, it was a bit of a placebo effect of wins and gains. And right. I, I, I don't really remember anything remarkable. <laughs> except feeling really good. Right. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about there. I wanted you to help me understand um, because many people have said uh, something along the lines of, you know, I really enjoyed OT3 or like you just said, OT7 wasn't that bad for me. Um, give me an example of what it is that happens for you, that happened for you while you're auditing OT3 that results in either you feeling good or feeling, my God, this is working. Or some people will say, oh yeah, I really felt I was getting rid of a lot of charge. Charge is supposed to be negative energy in, in your, you know, your case, your reactive mind, if you will. Um, and I go, other than just having a feeling of euphoria, which a lot of auditing sessions do end with, what did that mean for you of I enjoyed OT3 or I had wins or I had gains. What, what are wins and gains on OT3? Well, um, I can't quite remember. OT3 was so long ago. I don't remember too much about it except the, the phenomenon of feeling like I just sort of backed up from mental trappings. I, not like I was exterior, I don't mean backed up from my body, but, and I'll explain it this way, because I was listening to Eckhart Tolle, and it kind of made me go, oh, I think that's what I was kind of going on for me. And this is also relates to OT7, is that um, life is filled with, you know, words and labels, and Tolle talks about, um, uh, you know, if you're in a certain, if you feel bad and uh, you can't be mindful and you can't back away from it, just observe it. This complements so many things that happened to me that were wins in Scientology. Like when you handle roots, basically all you're doing is an ARC break handling is you're just backing up and observing the upset. That's what auditing does. It gets you to back up and just observe it. Right. And so real quick, just real quick, just so we don't lose too many people, right? In the yeah. beginning of every auditing session, you're supposed to address the rudiments or roots. One is an ARC break, which is just a Scientology word for an upset. The other one is a present time problem, which is just a Scientology word for anything that feels so important that you should be doing that instead of doing an auditing session. And the last one is a miswithhold, which is something that you've done, that something you've done bad, 
that someone else has made you wonder whether or not they knew that you did that bad thing. So before every auditing session, you're supposed to sit down and handle any attention on these rudiments, and then you begin the auditing session. So um, uh, I, I, that, I know that question was going to come up. So Karen, you were saying that when you address rudes, that's really what you're doing. Karen, so go ahead from there. To me, that's what you're doing. You just get to the point where you can back away from what's upsetting you um, to the point where, you know, it's, you're just observing it. You, you're sort of released from it. Um, and that's the only way I can liken uh, the, any phenomena that happened to me on three, but I have to say, especially on seven. Three was so long ago, I can barely remember it, but I do kind of remember just sort of feeling backed up from mental trappings or mental stress. Uh, I don't know how else to put it, but to, I have to say this. Being able to do OT7, I never believed in, in these spirits attached to your body. I, I believed in the bulletin called the nature of a being. And where, and then it's been a really long time since I've read it, but basically Hubbard talks about people being in different valences, different, it's like you can have one attitude one day and wake up and have a completely different attitude and nothing happened in between and, you know, sort of like, well, what happened? You know, well, it's the nature of a being. It's just, it's human nature. But I felt, I really believe the nature of a being. The nature of a being is not a confidential bulletin. It's not talking about, oh, you have this other, this depression. You're depressed about this because it's another being influencing you. No, it was because of you. And in this, some mass, some mental mass. And that's the way I treated OT7. I treated it like mental masses. Mm. And that was the way I got through it. And then, um, you know, of course you do get reads and blah, blah. And so then you just do the procedure. Um, and I have to admit too, that David Miscavige changed OT7. Uh, for, I think it was David Miscavige that changed it, where it was more arduous the, the second time I did it. And that's why it takes longer. I think he just turned it into a bigger money-making thing. People were, I got through it in six months the first time. So how did so he make it like, more Oh, no, I, I, that's fine. I, I, I don't want to get you off onto too many uh, different yeah. subjects with my follow-up questions. So yeah. carry on. So basically that's a, a phenomenon actually did happen to me on seven, where it wasn't some minor little thing where, whoa, I mean, the, the meter even, the, the needle was just, I, I, I won't get into the needle, but the needle was in a pattern where I you just couldn't do it anymore. It was just over. And it complemented what was going on in my universe. I felt just like, if you waved a wand, do you know what I mean? Is it okay to say the word universe? Does that can yeah, you yeah. kind of in your own world? If you wave a wand, you I bumped into nothing. And it was just an amazing feeling for me. Now, uh, that doesn't last for anybody. You know, life goes on and stuff comes in. And, and even in the world of Scientology, it doesn't last. I mean, think about it. I, I finished OT7 and they attested me to it. A month later, I'm on the ship and I'm getting more sec checking, more knots, and they're doing the same kind of procedure to handle things attached to your body. I just attested to being complete on that. <laughs> so, you know, the church itself doesn't believe you're actually done. You're just done for now. So it is a phenomenon that it was pretty amazing um, right. for me. And so, and, and that's that's the attitude and that's the way I approached it. Right, that makes sense. So as you're going up the OT levels, which you did in 86, and then you're redoing, um, uh, redoing seven from uh, 2005 to 2009, uh, I understand how you've explained your own concept of your own wins and gains, uh, even while 
doing OT levels without even completely believing what Hubbard said is the reason you have to do these levels. I understand everything you've said about that. <clears throat> how did your experience going up through those OT levels more than once, how did your experience and what you felt you were achieving compare to what you were told full OT was supposed to be? Yeah. You know, all I can say is I never really believed it. In, in the definition of full OT? Yeah, I never believed it. I never believed in clearing the planet. You know, who knows what, what I, why I was doing Scientology. It's like, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably the only person you've ever interviewed that didn't get in it to help mankind. No, I'm... I'm I got I, in that's it. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, people have all sorts of reasons. I mean, I, I, um, I had a conversation with my wife not too long ago where it was about um, just this concept of whether full OT was real. And she said, I don't really care. Like, that's not why I was in the Sea Org. She's like, I wasn't in the Sea Org because of full OT. I wasn't in the Sea Org because of clearing the planet. I was in the Sea Org for, you know, just the idea that we were doing good and helping people. And even at the time, I was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and and I didn't want to believe her. I mean, I didn't want to. I didn't want to believe that um, what she was saying. But that you know, I mean, it's similar to what you're saying. You, she's like, I don't have to believe in all of that stuff to justify the time I spent doing what I was doing. Right. And I was like, okay, I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> well, let's look at this. I mean, um, I was raised a Catholic, and um, and, and I had a a horrible childhood. I basically don't really have any parental support, familial support, which I think is why I got into Scientology because I also couldn't get into drugs and I'm, I'm a baby boomer, you know, and in the seventies, that was a big thing. Um, drugs and doing LSD and smoking pot. And, and here was a group that believed in living a good life. And they explained the concept, this is so weird, but this was a big draw for me. The concept of Satan, mind and body was explained. And I was like, wow, because here is spirit, mind and body. Here, when I was raised Catholic, it was like, you have a, you have a soul. And as a child, I think, God, where is it? I wonder where it is. And here, Somebody just said to me, no, you are a soul. And it was like, oh my God. I mean, why I never just stopped and thought about that myself or had it even explained to me as a child. I don't know, but that was a big thing for me. Wow. And so here in the seventies, you're talking about a very big cultural difference than today, which is another reason people aren't gonna get in it today, but very big cultural difference and People that were getting in it were, the mission I was at, we were, most of the people in it were 20 something. And a lot of musician, musicians, free spirits, it was very easy to belong to this church. They did not micromanage your life. I even smoked, I took a hit of pot once and after I was already a Dianetic auditor. And um, I thought, you know what, I don't wanna do this. And I just sort of checked myself and that it wasn't good for me to do it. And I told my auditor about it eventually. It was like, there was nothing made of that. Nowadays, oh my God, I would have been on lowers for so long, relabel, uh, labeled a drug revert, you know? So people need to understand it was loosey goosey. It was easy. And I, so to, to make sense of what, to try to make a little bit more sense of what you were just talking about, I didn't believe in the virgin birth, but I thought sitting in high mass gave me a sense of spirituality that I loved, you know, and it's a lot of nonsense when you look at it, somebody waving a smoky thing and incense and <laughs> communion, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And I just thought it was, wow. And, and I think um, that's, sometimes I think that's what people want. They want a sense of fellowship and a, to just 
be brought back to a sense of their own spirituality. And sometimes the nuns, the virgin birth, who cares? I don't need to believe that. I believe there's Catholics that have gotten abortions that do not believe they're going to hell. You know, and they're still Catholics. I believe that. They don't necessarily, but, but now let's compare that to Scientology. In the world of Scientology, you would be raked over the coals. You would be chastised. It would cost you millions of dollars to have gotten an abortion and to, you know, if you were Catholic and um, if that were its tenets and you compare what Scientology does to infractions. <sighs> right. I mean, a, 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 um, an analogous situation would be a Scientologist who, as a part of, let's say, their education, let's say they're going to med school or nursing school had to actually hand out psych drugs to people. That would be a similar thing. I have known people who were doctors, nurses, physicians, who as a part of their internships had to dispense psychiatric drugs uh, just because it was required. Oh. And then later they are worked over the coals, like you put it, on this subject. Um, and even barred from doing OT levels this lifetime because they had contributed to the drugging of the population. So that would be like, a, you know, a Catholic getting an abortion but not believing they were going to hell. Okay, so I didn't want anyone to get the impression that Scientology would sex check you for getting an abortion because that's not what you meant. No, 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 no. You no, meant no. if a Scientologist had done something as sinful right. as an abortion is viewed in Catholicism, right? Yeah, I was almost trying to say, now, if Catholicism were like Scientology, you would get raked over the coals. It would cost you a ton, shit ton of money for you to then get back in good graces and be able to, you know, receive the sacraments again. Right. If that's, if the, Catholic, if the Catholics operated the same way as the church did. Right. Mary, I think I would, I would say that most public Scientologists who never joined staff or, or were never in the Sea Org would probably say the same thing that you have, which is that they got into Scientology for themselves, not to help the planet or clear the planet. Because public Scientologists aren't clearing the planet. They're just doing, they're just receiving Scientology. Wouldn't you agree? Yep. And I think, I think, you know, the, and then they have friends of like mind. It's about living a good life, like I said, and it kind of, ooh, and look at this front group and look what they're doing you know, believe it, believe that. And I'm part of this group that's helping, even though I'm not, but I'm still raising my kids and blah, blah, blah. Right, I think right. that's why Sammy's in it, frankly, although now I found out he's on staff. So we'll see how that goes. Right. So even all the way through finishing OT7 twice, you <laughs> would say that through your own mental gymnastics, you carried on and persisted through, feeling like it was helping you in various ways, but never fully believed that whole story of how the body thetans came to be or what, or that there were body thetans or that at the end of all these OT levels, you were going to be an immortal spiritual being who could cause a, causatively exteriorize at will and be free of the birth to death cycle. That was never really on your radar? No, no, I never believed it. And which makes me seem like a total fool, total idiot. But see, what the thing is, I did experience, um, so just so I don't look like a total imbecile, uh, when I first got in, my life repair was great for me. And it was basically talk therapy and with a wonderful woman. And um, it, it was great for me. I really needed it. And it, I felt like it did repair my life. I didn't have a good childhood and all that. And um, I had, if you look at my track up the bridge, there was that I really liked. I really liked. The next thing I did was Dianetics. In those days, that was the next thing. Hated it. Hated Dianetics. But it was like, okay, but the next thing was the grades. I loved the grades. I thought they were playful and fun. I know people post the questions and they can look like nonsense, but I loved the grades. When I did the grades, it wasn't every single process of every single grade, which would have driven me crazy. It, was, it took me two weeks to do, um, I think, 
two or three of the grades because I I was co-auditing and then um, and those days you could you, lots of people were co-auditing their grades and it was just fun and easy peasy and blah um, so that's kind of a you know it's kind of a draw to the next thing and then I have to say as far as the OT levels go in the show that first uh, episode that I was in, I explain, and it kind of just got a little bit of airtime, where I had done everything. By 91, I was a permanent class six auditor and I had done through OT seven. I was really done. That's when I got married. I mean, I did OT seven after I, shortly after I got married. Was it seven? And I'm sorry, I did OT, God, I'm getting all my OT levels confused. <laughs> I'd already finished seven when we got married the first time. So I was real, and then when Michael was a little baby, I went off to the ship real quick in two weeks, did OTA. I mean, it was like that. So it's like, I was, I was good enough. And I felt there were too many things that happened that were really amazing wins with the auditing. So, and, the, and to me, it complemented what Scientology was preaching about spirit, mind, and body, <laughs> about the spirit. And, um, and, and there were just too many instances where it was euphoric, where it was just, I was never one of these people like, whoa, I'm exterior with full perception. For me, it was always exteriorization to me meant I was sometimes I just felt huge and like I was on the best drug you ever could have possibly been on. Like nothing could have rocked my world. I was so like sane and stable. Of course, none of it lasts because then you have to live life and it knocks you around and, you know, things come back in. But it kind of proved to me that it, the church was onto something or LRH was onto something here. I know of no other therapy without drugs that can produce these euphoric states that happened to me other than Scientology, some of the Scientology um, techniques. You know, maybe those same techniques on somebody else would have been like, wah, wah. you know? I hated Dianetics. I know people that love Dianetics. L10 is a total mind fuck. My husband loved L10. You know, I think what you're saying is so important um, because, you know, me, I never did any OT levels. I never attested to clear. I absolutely fucking hated Dianetics auditing. I also oh, hated yes. ever being asked. Oh, yeah, it was horrible. I also hated ever being asked to go past life during Scientology auditing. I was like, really? We're going to fucking do this? Okay. Yeah. Um, but... And I think some of the people who watch, I call them Scientology watchers, not a derogatory term, but people who've never been in, but they're paying attention and they read and they listen to the subject. I think what some people um, miss, because I think in a lot of the coverage of Scientology, it doesn't get adequately explained, is the difference between a sec check and a Scientology auditing session. Wow. A sec check is when you're being interrogated and it's usually on something you're not a willing participant in, you're a reluctant participant in. and a sec check is not auditing. And I'm mentioning this because a sec check is where you normally hear the horror stories. You know, I wasn't allowed to leave. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. <clears throat> but an auditing session usually ends with some state of euphoria somewhere on, on the scale, somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, you know, it's it, like an, it's almost one of the end phenomena of an auditing process is you have to have this this light, lightheaded uh, in Scientology, they call it keyed out, a lightheaded feeling of euphoria. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here to sort of reiterate what you're saying, because even for me, what you're saying was, was true, which is the number of auditing sessions I had, even though I didn't love getting auditing, the number of auditing sessions I had that ended with that feeling was like, oh, there's something to this. There's something important to this. And even though I don't love going through these processes and these auditing sessions, there's something here. Even two or maybe two or three times in my entire life, 
right. it was so significant or severe, like so intense, where like you feel so light and huge that you could explode. <laughs> Just like two or three of those over an entire right. lifetime of Scientology is enough to keep one hooked to to the promise of something greater. Right, like the greats to me, and 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 yes, you're right about and some spectrum of euphoria. Like, you know, it could be like, wow, oh, wow, that's cool. See, so the grace to me were just playful. You know, they weren't, I wasn't like, whoa, my God. Whereas one time I had, and I won't even say it because it'll, it's not necessary, uh, a particular kind of session that was, was its own technique. And it was like, whoa, my God. The only other thing that would have produced that would have been a drug. Now, Chris Shelton once said to me, well, you know, when you, that's like a runner's high. Well, okay, if that's a runner's high, well then, believe me, I've had a runner's high. This was better than a runner's high. Uh, but at the same time, it wasn't the runner's high that produced it. It was sitting there getting an auditing technique that went, whoa. I don't know why that is, but that's enough. Like you said, it was enough to compliment, you know, or to justify for me just trying something else. Does it yeah. bother you at all when you hear people try to explain, let me be more specific, when you hear experts in either cults or hypnotism <clears throat> who've never had any experience with Scientology, um, explain away that feeling that can be gotten in an auditing session in in very mechanical ways, like saying it has something to do with hypnotism or the electrical current, the, the, the minor electrical current going through the cans or, um, and look, I'm not trying to ask a leading question here. I'm not trying to say that I dismiss those explanations. My, my question here is because it was something that was so real for you, so real, not so real, but so real. Do you get bothered when people try to explain away other explanations or try to provide other explanations for that feeling other than the fact that, well, I don't know. My, I, I, my question seems a little lame. No, I think I understand. Um, I've, I've heard explanations from people that have never done Scientology, expert explanations, and now I can't quite remember, but I remember thinking – but you were never on the meter or, you know, and I think one was explaining meter reads. And I thought, no, you know, sometimes these meter reads are exactly what LRH says they were. That thing on the spring EFN I was telling you about, you know, <clears throat> a rock slam. <clears throat> these are meter reads that do mean what he says they mean. Other than that, I, I don't have any other explanation. I'm not refuting necessarily what they say in, a, in that finite explanation, but I just think it's broader than that. And, um, and I've heard explanations about hypnosis and there's a part of me that goes, really? I thought hypnosis, you know, I just have a different idea about hypnosis or brainwashing and and that, um, and, and I kind of go back to, all right, well, if it was hypnosis, then Scientology's, you know, he's got some sort of technique that will take you to a place where I think a lot of people would like to be hypnotized in. Because honestly, there were many times where it does make your life better. And it does, you know, when you, when you, you, you get a, in the earlier days, I, there's so much of my auditing toward the end was just horrible, period. But in the early days when it was easy peasy and I could, I felt truthful and it was fun. It just felt like I, I really was very sure footed and, um, and life was just pretty darn good. And I think it was because of Scientology, I, for me, because I was really uh, lost before Scientology. Like I said, I didn't have a lot of support. I had 
a very mixed up childhood. I mean, yeah, but anyway, I'm getting to that. But um, so it was sort of floating around without support, without really understanding what this was all about. I went to college. I was like, what do I major in? What do I want to be? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and all these, blah, I don't, you know, so here's this thing that kind of just simplified it. And, uh, and, and where I had friends and it wasn't wacky. It wasn't a cult to me. Um, I think the lower end of the bridge and without the church micromanaging your life can be like that. In those early days, it was like that. Um, but I'd also like to say that Scientology, I don't know if I'm segueing too much or if I already answered some question, but the thing that's bad about Scientology when I talk about those, let's just say the lower end of the bridge and getting auditing that's good and they're not micromanaging your life and blah, blah, blah. Things were also being introduced like KSW. KSW is a control mechanism. It's so just KSW is the keeping Scientology working policy letter? Right. You know, and it's like knowing the tech, having the tech, knowing, knowing it's correct, right? Well, it, it's just like, if you start wrapping your mind around concepts like that, now in the early days, it's like, oh yeah, I know it's correct. Oh yeah, I know it's true. Then you start getting into, okay, Dianetics, I don't know about that, but I'm not gonna admit it. I'm not gonna say it because I don't wanna go back. And other than that, you've already started to step in shit and you don't realize it. And that's the bad thing about Scientology. And then when they start micromanaging your life, <laughs> it's, you know, now you're on seven again, getting sec checked out the butt and you're agreeing to it and paying tons of money. <laughs> and people you know, are what, what you just mentioned is actually, <laughs> what? what you just mentioned is a great point. I think when people get into Scientology at the lower levels, it does have, um, the, the material is very common sense and is the helpful kind of material that you can apply to pretty much any part of your life. It's not intrusive into your life. It's not micromanaging. It's not, uh, it has an apparency of being a free thought body of knowledge, a, a body of knowledge that in, uh, um, inspires you to have more freedom. And right. then before long, like you don't realize at the lower levels that there's things you're not supposed to say and things you're not supposed to think. And then, like you said, you get to the point, you, you gradually get to a level, what like, or, or maybe it's the first time you're sent to ethics for doing or saying something wrong you shouldn't have done. And you gradually realize, as you progress in Scientology, you gradually more and more have to now censor your actions, censor your thoughts, censor your speech. And I think at the lower levels, when someone hasn't gotten that far, they haven't gotten to the point where they've had to start censoring themselves, it's very easy to go, what's the problem? This is great. This is great. Right? <laughs> right? I'll give you another one. Another one is you don't talk about your own case. Well, at the lower levels, when everything's great, it's like, well, that makes sense. It's like if you go to a psychologist, you, you know, if a psychologist said to me, well, when you leave here, don't talk about what we talk about. It's probably better to not talk to your family about it, you know, your case. Uh, so that it would make sense. This is a private session. This is what we're doing. So don't talk, don't talk about your own case. Okay, makes sense when it's good. But when it's bad, you want to start saying, God, I think this is shit. Or you want to say, I don't believe this OT3 to a friend of yours. You know, this, this will get you into trouble now. This will get you eventually declared if you take it too far so you just it's this incremental learning to shut up and that's a good one is don't talk about your own case if you have a disagreement you're supposed to go to the right terminals the right people in the organization that will handle this like you go to the qualifications division if you need correcting you know, that's who you should go to. Or you should go to the chaplain if you blah, blah. If you tell a Scientologist friend about some grievance you have, that's, that's potentially a very big problem for you, which basically led to my demise.
<laughs> um, so uh, a little while ago, you kind of compared um, being able to get through OT7 and 8. The fact that you were able to get through OT7 and 8 and not wholeheartedly believe in, in what Hubbard said about uh, you know, the incident 75 million years ago and, and body things. And you compared that to um, being able to participate in Roman Catholicism and the pomp and the circumstance and yet not fully believe in the virgin birth and all that stuff. One difference when you explain that, that comes to mind is that you can participate in Roman Catholicism without having to give up massive amounts of cash. Um, and so perhaps it, uh, the way I think about it is that it would be easier to continue to participate in a religion like Roman Catholicism and yet not fully believe because there's not very much being asked of you. How were you able to um, justify the continued expense of Scientology, um, if not, or while not, fully believing in everything that Scientology says about what the OT levels are supposed to be and what they're supposed to give you? Um, yeah, there's kind of, uh, might be two answers to that, but I have to say from 73 to 91, when I did the bridge the first time, I spent tens of thousands of dollars. From 2005 to 2010, when I finished OT8 the second time, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. I was trapped in that. From 2005 to two, when I finished that. Um, okay, so let's back up. So in that time, you know, the intensive, I mean, programs weren't that long. You could finish things quickly. I, I was making, well, this is 70s, but I was making $440 a month and I could afford to buy intensives and get auditing. Or then I- For the listeners, for the listeners real quick, an intensive is a 12 and a half hour block of auditing. Right. And also I trained as an auditor myself and I would co-audit with somebody else and- do more auditing. So that's basically free when you when you co-audit. So, okay, I did the whole briefing course. I paid $1,500 for the briefing course. The briefing course took me 10 years to do because I was working in, in, during the day doing the briefing course at night. And then I did my internship. So OT3- today, today it cost $30,000. Right. And today there is no briefing course. So Well, there is. There is, but well, somewhere. Anyway, yes, but that's the difference. And and um OT3, I pay I remember asking my mom if I could borrow $3,000 from her to pay for this OT3 package. That included setups and OT3. No way you could do that today. So it was very doable. I never, okay, so here's where you get into, I was never heavily regged for anything except once in that one period of time. And that was to pay for uh, OT7 and 8 on, on the ship. And that was in the uh, late 80s. Okay, so, okay, let's fast forward to 2005. And by the way, 96, I think 95, 96 is GAT 1. I, Golden, Golden Age Tech Attack 1. That's when things change, OT7 changed, the technology of it changed. So I got uh, kind of, okay, I'll go in and do it. And I had this friend that I really liked that wanted to go in and do the course. It's a course. Mary, and can I, I jump in for one second? Yeah. I just want to explain to the listeners that in 96, the golden age of tech is when um, Miscavige completely re-imaged and reimagined and reinvented basically the entire bridge. And, and then in 1997, he came out with the golden age of tech for basically the OT levels. And that's when everybody who had ever finished OT7 were told they had to do it again. So that's why we're talking about right. that as, as a pivotal moment. That's why, right. that's why you were getting pressure between 96 and 2005 to get back onto OT7. Correct, correct. So it's amazing that I managed to put them off that long. And, but, but in 96, I did go in and just do the course part of it. And where you read the 
bulletin on the changes and blah. And I remember when I was done with that, I thought, no way do I want to get back on this level. And we finished that course, my friend and I, we were at flag. She fit, we both attested. She went upstairs to get into the HTC to start it. And I walked out the door. I, that was it. Nobody stopped me. Nowadays, you can't get out the door. I attested, I walked out the door and I just didn't want to get back on seven again. And, you know, they tried. And also I still had, you know, younger kids. I just didn't want to get, do it. Um, then in 2005, uh, you know, I'm still being badgered to get back on it. And now my kids are older. And then the final hook was a really good friend of mine. Believe me, they, the church knows and will try every which way until they hit pay dirt, until there's something that is your hook, you know? And I just had a really good friend that I liked and admired very much that talked to me about getting back on seven. And that was the final thing. Um, and she had done it and was going on about it. And I thought, okay, you know, like I said, my kids are older, I'll give it a shot. <sighs> Many points of regret. And that's one of the biggest ones. Um, it was just awful, awful. So from the seventies up until Wait, was it the 70s or the 80s you got into Scientology? 73 to 91. Okay. So that's almost, that's what? So Wait, what do you mean 91? Not, 73 to 91 was when I did the bridge the first time. And I, and oh, I got it. In 91, I finished the classics internship. I got it. I got it. Oh, yeah. and one thing else I wanted to define for the listeners real quick. When you said you paid $1,500 for the briefing course. The briefing course is short for the St. Hill Special Briefing Course, which is the name of the Class 6 Auditor Course, which is the biggest course in Scientology. Um, okay, so between the late 70s and 2005, you would not say that during that period you considered Scientology to be a, a, a giant suck, a money suck, a giant... A, a, it, it wasn't an expensive proposition for you. No. It didn't actually get expensive until they got you back on in 2005 and between then and the time that you left. Right. You know, I'm not saying it wasn't expensive. Spending tens of thousands of dollars is a lot of money. And from 73, you know. Over but 40 years, though. But 70, that was 73 to 91. I spent tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe... Maybe, and, and I did um, I did get a little bit of an inheritance there that covered 35,000. So that was for OT7, 8, and blah, blah. Anyway, so tens of thousands. But let's now go to 2005. It took me 11 intensives to just get set up to get back onto 7 again. This, what the fuck? I'm telling you. From David Miscavige had a I just these orgs turned into padding padding your programs. And I think it's call comes from David Miscavige. I really do believe it. Um, padding programs and um, you know, so 90% of what I did to get set up to get onto seven again was bullshit. Just a lot of correction that didn't, but just way too much. That's 140 remember. hours of auditing, which probably costs about $60,000, yeah, depending on where you, something yeah. Something like that. I don't even know, but you know, I have to admit this is a period in here where I, there's so many times I just go, God, you know, I kick myself for persevering and that became my attitude. My attitude was persevering, just get through it. When I, and it wasn't, hor it got, it wasn't horrifically horrible in the beginning, but it wasn't fun. And it got more and more horrible to the point of being horrifically horrible by the end. In that period of time, then the basics came in. You could not go in, 
the organization without, now you have to go in every six months and they know they, and all this stuff that's going on that you're unaware is going on. Like they know the second you walk in the door, there are so many people that want money from you that know Mary Khan is here. Ooh, and they have you qualified. You know, it's like a, a car salesman gets people qualified. Who can afford what? You know, so obviously they knew uh, or felt like we could afford the fact that I had this 11 intensives. And um, and then, so now basics are in. Now my husband's on the level also. So he has to go in every six months. I'm going in every six months. Both of us are just getting hit up constantly to buy books, um, who, who, to buy just special things constantly. And then if you think about it, they, they have you when you're getting sex checked and then you have to go to the ethics officer, whether you're doing lowers or not, you have to go to an ethics officer just to get, to get clear. It's part of the routing form, you know, okay, now you're done with your sex check. Now you're going to the ethics officer. I can't tell you how many times I was behind closed doors where I could not get out until I bought a set of basics or donated money to the IES. And this is another area why the church needs to be shut down because they have a way. Now they've got you mentally trapped, physically trapped, and you can't get out until I remember giving, giving them money and feeling so bad and telling my husband when I got home and him being so mad at me until he went in and had to do the same thing himself, you know? And um, it, it was just, horrible i mean there was no ias back in 73 I, I was never hit up for money for the ias it's just constant and and i just i don't know if people really understand i wish people understood how horrible it is to be so mentally locked down and then physically held where the they're if you raised a shit fit, you could get out, but you're also going to possibly get declared. Right. Yeah. I was, I wanted to clarify that because in some res it, in, it is very true that let's say you're in an ethics, let's say you're with the ethics officer and he's having a conversation with you about wanting to sell you your basics, which by the way, around 2008 or nine, David Miscavige re-released all of the books Hubbard had written and all Scientologists were being demanded to buy a complete new set of books for many, many thousands of dollars. That's what the basics means. So if this ethics officer is trying to tell you on the importance of buying the basics, I want to clarify, you're not saying that there's someone guarding the door physically preventing you from leaving. Your point is you can't just stand up and walk away from the ethics officer. That has serious ramifications for you. Is that right. when you say you can't leave, that's what you mean, right? Right. And there was, something it's not like he, it's not like he's saying, don't you dare walk away from me. You just know that you can't. You know that you can't. But I'm telling you, I mean, I, I've been behind closed doors where there would be my ethics officer and then somebody standing in front of the door. I mean, the message. But, but, but he's gone. pretending that he's just casually standing there. It's not like he says, you're not allowed to leave and I'm the security guard. He's just conveniently positioning himself in front of the door so you get the message, right? Right. Well, they hammer on you. You can start out saying no, but I'm telling you, you're going to be so beaten down that you, you're just going to, you're going to give them something to just get out of the damn room, you know, and at the, on the ship, they have two mandatory briefings a week. And if you don't go, they'll come get you out of your cabin. And if you don't, if you raise hell, then you're in more, you're in deep doo-doo. So you go. And the first day there, I was in a mandatory briefing, not one of those, a mandatory briefing with just people that were there to do OTA. Late at night, it was horrible. And um, I remember walking out of that room and somebody that had just finished eight said, let me give you a tip, just play along or it'll make it so much easier for you. In other words, when you go to these mandatory briefings, you, you pretend like you're into it. And it'll make it easier on your, it'll make it easier on yourself. 
And, Do you remember and, the name of that person? No. It wasn't LD Sledge, was it? <laughs> no, it was a lady. Yeah. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. No, but that particular breathing, I'll give you this, this will highlight another example, those kinds of things. That there was probably 10 of us in that room, and it was an IAS briefing. And briefing is short for give money. Uh, so they're briefing just this OT8 people. And uh, we're all, some of them are sitting there like this. And finally they get to the nuts and bolts where there's a board and they want people to give. One guy stands up right away, writes down a thousand dollars, turns around and goes, can I go to bed now? Like that. He was super pissed off. Everybody that in that room that night missed their early morning session <laughs> that they had with in the in the with somebody else, not their own person. Well, they the the guidance counselor session, the, the the guidance center got super pissed about that briefing because there's that constant was, war between yeah. the people who are trying to make sure that everyone's well fed and well rested for auditing sessions. And the fundraisers who don't give a shit about that. Right. And the people who have the higher rank, if you will, are the fundraisers. That's right. That's right. And those mandatory briefings, the two mandatory briefings every week were on, I think, Friday and Sunday. You had to go, and there was a guard in front of the door. And if you wanted to leave, he they would question you. Right. And you better have a damn good reason. You better be throwing up or something. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Mary, I was just having a chat with um with Joey Chait a few days ago, and I haven't posted that interview yet, but I will soon. And we were talking about I, I I mentioned something that had just occurred to me recently as one of the biggest examples of the culture, how, how the culture as far as a demand on your for your cash has changed in the last couple decades. And you'll you'll know this. Uh, between 87 in 2004 or five, whenever Tom Cruise got his medal, the highest honor, the highest rank in the IAS was patron meritorious, which was $250,000. That's the most money wow. the IAS could ever conceive that anybody would ever give it. And you could have a double patron meritorious or triple patron meritorious, but the highest rank was patron meritorious. Well, now the highest rank is like $75 million. Like now the, right? Like right after Tom Cruise got his medal, they released the um, million dollar status. Uh, they released the half a million silver meritorious, million was gold meritorious. And then they did um, uh, silver meritorious, gold meritorious, and then platinum meritorious. Platinum meritorious was two and a half million. So right after Tom Cruise got his medal, the highest rank in the IAS went from a quarter million to two and a half million. So it 10 X, wow. right? Wow. <laughs> and then since then it's continued to go up to 75 million. I'm, mm -hmm. I mentioned that as an example of a real world demonstration of how much the demand for your cash has gone up. It used to be that a quarter million was the most and there was no fundraising to buy new buildings. Now wow. 75 million is the most and there's a constant demand that you donate extra money to buy buildings. I mean, it's amazing how much it's changed since 2005. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. You know, when I, at the time, see, there were all sorts of red flags for me. And one of them was when Tom Cruise got his medal. I was one of those people that when I saw that, and I don't think I saw it, I don't think I was there live. I think I saw it on video. I just looked at that and I thought, oh my God, these two look like is there some sort of bromance going on? They looked, it looked so dumb to me. And I remember my auditor even saying to me at one point after that, do you know that we have to call Tom Cruise, sir? And he did it in such a way where he was smiling and looked lighthearted about it. But I knew he was pissed off. He didn't want to, me to, he didn't want to be in the position where I'm going, writing a KR, 
saying, my otter told me we have to call Tom Cruise, sir. And like, my otter told me, that's what he meant. I guarantee you, he was pissed off. But he was saying it like, do you know we have to call Tom Cruise, sir? You know, like, he was, he was just letting me know he's pissed off about that. So he's saying it in like a happy way, expecting so you to read between so the I, lines. Yeah, so if I do write a report, he can go, no, I wasn't bitching, you know, blah, blah. This particular author was quite a rogue. He had a way of telling me stuff that he shouldn't have been saying. <laughs> all right, so all of this was, I had asked you, um, how did you justify carrying on with these levels that you didn't necessarily believe in, um, despite the enormous expense? And your point was it really wasn't that expensive until 2005. I didn't justify it at all. I just basically wanted off. I wanted off so badly. And we did spend a tremendous amount of money. And, you know, I just, I just kick myself about it that we didn't get pissed off earlier and go, no. I mean, I remember sitting with the, you know, they would play David and I against each other too. And, uh, and there's something about me that they always wanted me there if there was a briefing. Because they know, they just understand psyches. David could sit in a briefing for five hours and say no. But if I was there, it'd be like, oh my God, give him something. I just couldn't stand it. So they had, they knew how to play each other. I remember sitting in, in the IAS office um, with David and God, I just, by now, I want off this level. I want to be done with this church so badly. And they're selling David on going to the IAS event that October 2009. And I'm thinking, oh my God, please don't do it, please don't do it. And he just, and he gives them his card and he, ah! I'd never been, I'd never even been to Europe. I'd never been overseas. I hated flying and I hated this fucking church. And, and, and that's the same thing with OT8. I didn't pay for OT8, but David had to pay for it. So, oh, Mary can use David's. The only reason I went to the ship is because if I said no, then it's another why. It's there, you know? People that don't, and the other thing is people that don't go to the ship from seven, their sec checks were longer. You started to hear about that. I didn't want my sec check to be longer. When I was on the ship, they were bleeding me dry and injecting. I had to go clear again when I was on the ship. Again, I did more knots for seasickness. They had, these are just flat out, really expensive intensives. And I wanted off so badly. And at one point they had been, I'd been calling David, I need another intensive. I already used everything on account. And at one point I thought, no, that's it, I'm done. And I told him, they had the routing form out for me to route off the ship. They thought they that wasn't going to happen. And they were asking for one more intensive. And I remember thinking, if I don't finish now, they're going to bug me for the rest of my life to go back to the ship. So I said to David on the phone, can you just pay for one more intensive? And if I don't finish that, finish it and get on to This is just to get on to eight. People don't understand. This is just to get on to eight, which takes two days. You know, I'm there, there two months with this shit. And um, so he did. And do you know that when I left the ship, that intensive was still on my account? I didn't break into it. And you know what I did? I bought a ton of books with it. Why? Because I don't want them to call me back to the ship because they know I have an intensive on account. I wanted to use it all up. It was a total waste of money. <laughs> Just, it's, it's, this is how they get you coming and going. But even the second time, you did eventually manage to finish OT8 before leaving the ship, or you didn't? I did. A second time. Yeah. You know, I don't remember OT8 much, and I got to tell you, it's very short. And there's a, uh, believe me, a friend of mine even said this to me too, who also went through this horror, the same kind of horror on the ship that I did. And she asked me, Mary, how did we do it? Because we were both hating it. And I think it's like this. Um, 
you go, you get into a mental position where you know what corridor, what mental corridor you need to go down to finish. And you stay in that corridor. You, it's, almost, it's almost not knowing it, but knowing it. Because, believe me, because like you get a sec check out. One of the last things you do when you're leaving the ship is another sex check just to make sure everything's cool. Well, um, imagine if I'm still in this, like, if I would have let go and go, I'm so fucking glad I'm getting off this fucking ship. You're not going to get off that ship. You're still in some mental thing. Okay, just stay here. Just stay here. I was, I know I was FNing that sex check because it was like, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. It's like, oh my God, I'm almost free. And like I said on the show, when I walked down that gangplank, you can feel the bungee cords are starting to fly off. It's like, oh my God, I'm almost totally free. And when I hit the ground in Miami, I wanted to kiss the ground. When we landed, I remember walking where you go through customs. I just wanted to kiss the ground. Little did I know that they, once you're OT8, they still don't let up. It's like, as an OTA, now you need to. So I couldn't just drift away, which is what I really wanted to do. Right. How do the other guys like the f fucking Pat Cloudin and um, who's uh, Brian, 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 who's um, Kugler, Brian Kugler? How the fuck do they stay in? I, right. I mean, how do they manage to, to push down and swallow everything that you're describing? You had to push down and swallow. And yet they still carry on with their smiley faces and they contribute to the fundraising and they get their kids involved. How do they do it? I think, Pat, I don't know. I, yeah, Pat, I think it's just, um, first of all, you're still in this bubble where and then it's your family and as far as um uh oh my god brad kugler or well ben is his father right that ben's your friend right yeah ben kugler i mean the last intent he had 40 intensives of sec checking sec checking is completely abusive after a certain level and I want to just explain to people, just real briefly about sex checking. They think, people call it interrogation to make it easier for people to understand it. And I just want to make it clear, sex checking has its own technique. Where let's say somebody's asking, have you ever stolen a grape? But usually the questions are broader than, have you ever stolen anything? You know, let's say uh, you're just sitting there and it's like, uh, you're thinking, God, I'm clean on this. And... But if it doesn't read and doesn't FN, the auditor has these buttons he uses. And it's like 15 of them. It becomes this pounding, pounding, pounding. It's just, it's such a mental fuck that I don't know how anybody gets to the point where you, you know, I mean, it's just, it's a mental survival that people go through. I mean, if, if life is about survival, you know, you, you just learn ways to survive and the mind, I think, learns how to survive this. I know some people that could lie their way through a sec check. Um, in fact, the lady that wrote the first KR on me that called me and that, that she, she was called in to get sec checked toward the end because she was disaffected. She's the one that told me what musical chairs was. You know, she's the one that got me to read Marty Rathbun, right? She was called in to get sex checked. And she said, Mary, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go in. I'm just going to not say stuff. And I said, I'm not going to do it. She goes, oh, come on. It's just a consideration. Because she's thinking. She, some people have a different way. With Not me. I couldn't. She was one of those people people would call in to FN because they wanted to see an FN. Because she could just FN. So a floating needle. You know, needles like that. Four months later, this lady's calling me up, 
having a nervous breakdown. She had been getting sex checked four hours a day for four months and she was going out of her mind. She was hyperventilating. She was saying, Mary, I don't know what I'm gonna do. There's stuff I don't wanna tell them. I said, Kathy, just tell them everything. Let go. I just felt, you know, she didn't wanna tell them like we were having conversations and stuff like that. She, they were driving her nuts. And that's what the church will do. If they think you have something, they're gonna pound on you beyond being clean. You know, if they want to get you it's through a great it, point. they'll get you through it. Yeah. It's a great point. I describe sex checking as interrogation just to differentiate it from an actual auditing session, which has a different purpose and is not an interrogation. But the use of the e-meter um, in a sex check or in an interrogation, as I've said, um, gives the sex checker so much leverage against. I think that's your point is it's not just an interrogation. It's not just someone asks you a question and you say no and you move on. Like if we were to do a little demonstration, if I had an e-meter in front of me, and especially if I already suspect that you're not telling me something, I could misuse the e-meter if I wanted to. Absolutely. I could be like, I could be like, hey, Mary, so um, have you said anything negative to your husband about Scientology? And let's just say I look up at you expectantly like you're supposed to answer the question. Well, go and ahead. We're going to do a little drill. Yeah. yeah. Well, what did you think of when I asked you the question? See, immediately I'm so fucked up. <laughs> go ahead. No, keep on. Just keep denying. Just keep denying. What did you think of when I asked you the question? I didn't think anything. I haven't told my husband anything about negative oh, okay. about Scientology. Well, what else did you think when I asked you the question? I was waiting for you to check a button, I guess. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let me check this. On the question, have you said anything negative to your husband about Scientology? Has anything been suppressed? All right. We'll take another look. Have you said anything negative to your husband about Scientology? <laughs> okay. Right. See, okay. The so just for the listeners, the this could go on for hours. Right. And there's another thing that, that people do. And I know I did, and I'm not the only one where let's say you go, well, just take a look. Yeah. Take a look. Then you get, to, you get to the point where you go, well, God, find something. So you just go, well, you know, maybe it's because I told him that the toilet seat, he should put down the toilet seat. And it made me think of how the toilet seats at the, at, in the bathrooms are all, you were up in the girl's restroom or something at flag. You know what I mean? I'm just making that up hypothetically. Okay, so. Good, and then I could go, okay, good. All right, well, you need to float it on that. Let me recheck the question. No, Have you said anything negative to your husband about Scientology? That's right. No, how to go from there? So. So do you have a similar orbit of your own? Did you ever leave up a toilet seat when you should have put it down? It's like, ah, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like if I'm, and while this all this is happening, you know that every minute you spend doing this is money out the door. Right. Right? So someone in your shoes who's getting a sex check like this, or your friend who's being sex checked four hours a day for four months, she can sit there and do a little song and dance all she wants. But the leverage that the auditor or the sex checker or the church has is they don't have to let you finish this sex check. They can just keep going. And you have to either bear it and keep paying and hang in there or or risk losing everything you have all of your family for, like if you were to get up if if someone like your friend who was a veteran scientologist and an ot and had been in scientology for decades if she were to actually get up without permission from that auditing that sec check session and walk out that door and say i'm done with this and put down the cans and walk out she would almost certainly be declared a suppressive person right there would be she'd be called in then a comment, don't show up with that automatic declare. It leads to a declare. Unless you go in and get cleaned up, period. It right. leads to a declare. They'll give you an opportunity to get cleaned up because they, they don't want to lose you. They want an opportunity to keep taking your money. But if you said, no, I'm, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, and you never went back, you'll be declared. That's the, right. the leverage the church has over you. Right. And that, you know, if just as a matter of interest, I remember with Sam – you know, toward the end, um, just as a point of interest, it, he said to me, 
you know, like, well, I just was refusing to go in anymore. I just knew it's just, I can't take this anymore. And, he, you know, of course the church is working on him, showing him all the bulletins that fortify how I'm off the rails and having him do his doubt formula, you know, and the only way he can go with that and write up his own sins, the only way he can go with that. So he can realize that he needs to disconnect from me, right? And at one point he says to me, with disdain, you know, mom, you've been given every opportunity to handle this thing. There's only one opportunity to handle this thing. There's only one way, and that's go in and get sex checked. This, he, he's made, you know, it's like every opportunity, every opportunity is their way or the highway. Like there's so many different options within the church. Like I could have gone to the chaplain or, no, there's one way, you know, and so the church makes the same with him. Oh no, we've called her in. We've had your husband, your father try to work on, you know, all her friends are trying to get her to come in. They've all been really nice and she's just refusing. And it all means that I have more sins and transgressions. Those part, that's all part of the trappings. Right. So how does someone like the Kuglers and the Cloudins, how do they continue to carry on with it? Well, personally, I think for Ben Kugler and the Kuglers, it's, it's a, they've got a very large family. And they're all, you know, like Ben Kugler's sons are all married to Scientologists whose parents are all in. So, you know, they lose all of that. And it is one of the saddest things about Scientology when you, when you do uh, get declared is that your, your friends turn on you. It's so sad, you know, so everybody's trying to avoid that. And uh, I think that's a big reason some people, I think it's narcissism. If you have a narcissistic bone in your body, the Church of Scientology will make it the main bone in your body because it'll turn you into a full-blown narcissist. <laughs> Truly, it's got the tech, I don't know what it is about Scientology, where you lose all empathy and compassion and if right. if yeah, so I think that's why. I think um, Pat Cloudon, he's given lots of accolades. Um, he goes and speaks. He has, His kids are in. Um, so he, you know, people want to keep their comforts. They don't want to rock the boat. This is so true in so many aspects of life. You know, we see that in our political system now and our government. I mean, in the way people are getting divided and want to keep, anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But, but like even you, you, but even you didn't want to rock the boat either. And yet you were pushed to a point, And I think this is how most people end up leaving Scientology. They were pushed to their breaking point. And I guess we have to assume that the cloud ends and the Kuglers simply have not yet been, because it's not like, it's not like you were like one day, like, yeah, I don't no longer care about losing my family. That's not right. how it goes. Right? No. Like It's pushed to a breaking point. I, but I was so messed up at the time that I didn't even have these words. I remember saying to Sam, um, we, we had a, this is when it all unfolded and Sammy was sitting in the living room with me with David. And he was, mom, please go and he's crying. Please, I would do anything to save this family. And I was, all, all the, the only words I had was, I just can't. And I couldn't figure out why. You know, it's like, well, I just can't. It's like, I was done. I was done being a Scientologist. And I didn't have those words. My husband so, brought home. So even when course. Sammy, I, I'm, oh no, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Keep going. No, no, go on. So it's even when funny. Sammy is sitting there saying those words to you, mom, please, I'll do anything to save this family. He is acknowledging that it is the church that is going to blow up the family if you don't go in and bend the knee. He's not saying, mom, if you don't make this decision, I hate you and don't want to see you ever again. He's acknowledging, I want you to do X because if you don't do X, the church is going to do Y and we're not going to have a family. 
Right. But now his mindset is the cult mindset where it's my fault because all I had to do was go in and I could have saved the family. I did manage to look at him at that point and go, Sammy, I would never disconnect from you. I would never disconnect from you. That's one see, that's another thing that people need to understand about families. Some families, I'm, I mean, parents will disconnect from their kids. We never, ever, ever would have disconnected from our kids. You know, I asked David that early on, you know, what would ever happen if, you know, one of our kids, we were thinking Michael was going to be a Scientologist, were declared. He said, well, I'd say adios. See you next life. You know, <laughs> never. Meaning, I mean, see, you know, meaning, I, meaning he would see Scientology next life. Yeah. You know, that's what he meant when he said that. So, uh, yeah. So everybody's different in that regard. Um, I just didn't want people to think all parents get into that or, you know, I never pushed Scientology. Uh, I, I mean, I introduced it to my kids and I wanted them to be Scientologists. Um, but when Michael didn't take to it, I didn't push it. You know, I would like to say something else too. Not that this is going to make any big difference, but I felt so bad for Michael because Michael's this, our son that, did not want to do Scientology. And yet, um, so we had him in um, public school, you know, regular public school, and then he went to a private high school. He was bullied and shunned because somewhere, somewhere, somebody along the line found out that we were Scientologists and that made him Scientologist. And I just thought, wow, that's so shitty. And I could never call people out on it. Why is that because we're Scientologists, you know? It's just friends disappeared. When Michael came home one day, he goes, I don't know why I can't go over to Thomas's anymore, but for some reason, his parents don't want me to. And I thought, God, he, he's, getting, he's getting it from both directions. <laughs> I mean, bullying, it, it happens on both sides. I mean, I really do think oh, sure. people shouldn't bully Scientologists. Just talk to them, you know, say, I really think if, when people ask, what can I do besides writing your representatives or whatever you can do, if you find out you're talking to a Scientologist, um, can you see me, by the way? Because I just got a Facebook message. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can see you. Okay. Um, like, I, I wish people would actually talk to Scientologists and say, have you heard about the abuses? In a nice way. Right. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm tired of the social, uh, let's just let it ride and let them be a Scientologist if they want to be a Scientologist. And, you know, I have relatives that don't want to say anything to Sam because they want him to be able to reach out to them. And I understand that, but I just think they need to say something. I think they need to say, you know, have you found out about the abuses and why not? You know, or how come you're just believing the church and you're not believing your mom? Or just ask questions like that, you know, right. and, and don't buy. See, Sammy will do the good roads, fair weather tactic with them, and then they buy into it. And then they come and talk to me and say, oh, Sammy's doing really well. Right. So, Mary, if in 2003, 2004, you had become aware of the kind of information uh, that we're now aware of regarding David Miscavige, the conditions at international management, uh, the way Miscavige conducts himself in private, um, the, what, what life in the Sea Org was like at international management. Do you think that would have made a difference for you as far as your in continued involvement in Scientology? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Positive. And why? What is it about that info that would have made you go, okay, game over? Yeah, I know. I know people that know about abuses. Ben Kugler had his own son physically assaulted when he was up at Int. And he told me it was David Miscavige. But then later when I brought that up to in to Osa, he was called in. And then he oh, Mary, I never said that. Blah. You know, um, so I had to basically say, well, I'm not, I don't quite remember, but I think the fact is he was beaten up, whether it was David Miscavige or somebody else. Right. So Ben Kugler, I just want Osa to hear this again. Ben Kugler told you 
that his son Brad was assaulted by David Miscavige at international management. Yes. And, and then took it all him. back, took it all back after you told someone at Oso about this. Yeah. See, he's, a, he's turned into a flying monkey because he's also one of those people that made the video on me. So he knows and doesn't care. Um, it's not, but like I said, it's not that he doesn't care, but it's not, it's not a breaking. It's not something that, no, I, I won't. For me, like I said, when I was cold cocked, I was personally done and would have backed away. But once I was off the ship, um, I started hearing, like, in fact, it was Ben Kugler that said to me, God, did you hear about the, all these execs up at Int Management leaving? That was like, ding. That wasn't a deal breaker, but it was a ding. And then it was like something, I remember thinking something's wrong. And then um, I read, for me, to be done, 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 not just personally done. Personally done, I would have drifted away, let my family do their thing. Uh, but completely done was when I read uh, Lawrence Wright's um, New Yorker article, which I thought was amazing. I thought he was very fair. But um, it was reading the, um, the Truth Rundown and uh, John Brousseau's um, Tampa Bay Times article that that was, oh my God, holy shit. And then I said to, I hadn't read Marty. I wasn't reading blogs. I didn't even like Marty uh, when I did try to read it uh, when eventually. But anyway, uh, Somewhere along the line, I heard something about musical chairs, and I said to this friend, do you think, what is this musical chair? And she looks at me and I goes, she takes me to her house, pulls it up on the internet, and shows it to me. This is the same friend that was losing her mind getting sex checked? Yeah, she's still in. Um, so, so that was like, wow, this is really weird. But then it was the physical assaults. And the Anderson Cooper uh, history of violence, it's like all this, uh, that was after, that's actually after I left. But the Debbie Cook email was, yeah, it ain't just me thinking something's wrong with this church. And mm -hmm. she, she did a masterful job of nailing it for anybody that wanted to be a Scientologist. She wasn't against Scientology in that email. And uh, that was, um, that was, that was a big thing for me and the physical assault. Something about, for me, the physical assault was a no. I can't go back in this church and support it in any way, shape, or form. You know, it, in the beginning, when I was so messed up, I, you know, and I just want to save my son. Um, I was saying to my son, people are being beaten up. And I, and he was like, and at one point I said to him, Sammy, if I got 10 people over here to tell you their story, would you just be willing to listen? And there was a pregnant pause. You can almost hear the machinations in his head. And you know, you could see where that goes for him. Losing your friends, losing his job, losing what he thinks is really good about Scientology. And he just looked at me and went, no, he doesn't want to know. That's where most Scientologists stand. That's why it's very easy for David Miscavige and these people to say, you can't read the internet. Because in fact, it was Ben Kugler, another one, that said to me, this was remarkable to me, where he said, that when he was in with the ethics officer going over why you can't read the internet, the ethics officer said, because it will lead you down to a path that it could make you start turning against Scientology. And Ben bought that. That's like, <laughs> oh, heaven forbid, I find out Dave Miscavige 
just beating people up and I turn against Scientology. It's like, I mean, what kind of mind do you have to have to like buy that? Right, like there's only two implications from that statement. One, you're so weak-minded that we're afraid you're going to buy the lies and turn against Scientology. Therefore, don't read the internet, right? So yeah. you're either telling someone that they're so weak-minded they can't separate fact from fiction on their own. Or you're saying there's legitimate information out there that will turn you against Scientology, so don't read it. Right, right. Either way. And they don't want to know. They don't want to know either way. That's the thing about some people that are in. Like, Sammy just doesn't want to know. Because it, it would mess... He doesn't, this is the saddest thing about people like Sam. And I think it's one of the best lessons I've learned since I've been out is that they don't know how to live without it. That's why people don't leave. A lot of people don't know how to live without it. They don't know how to create their lives. This is a great, big, scary world where they don't belong. And, you know, and actually that's kind of true. But, but they don't know that it actually is not scary. It's, it's amazingly kind and wonderful. It's just they don't feel like they belong. Yeah, incredible stuff. I wonder, let me know if you think this is true. Part of me thinks that the reason families or individuals like the Kuglers and the Cloudens are able to persevere through all this is that they simply have enough money that they can afford to persevere. Like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like part of the breaking point for why the sec checks were so terrible, the the routing form was so terrible, OT7 and 8 was so terrible, and all, I'm sorry, uh, OT8, the, the uh, getting clearances for OT8 and doing it, was the, the pressure it puts on the relationship and on money. Like if you had millions of dollars to spend and it didn't bother you when the registrars asked you for money or it didn't bother you to ask to pay for one more intensive, it just seems that it changes the dynamic of the pressure or the stress. I could be totally wrong. But like the 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 um the Kuglers seem to be very well off and the Cloudens are very wealthy. Do you think that allows them to put up with a lot of this stuff or is that too too much of a simplification? I think it allows some people, I know some people that are probably just fine and doing pretty good that it pissed them off and, and walked out, walked out of a bit heavy, um, si uh, you know, reg cycle for IAS and they ended up declared, you know, saying this is bullshit. I'm not giving you another penny. I heard Charmaine on the phone with somebody when we, David and I were being pummeled once for money. And she was in the other room on the phone and she came right in with us and said, this guy's a millionaire and he's only giving me $10,000. This is going to affect his eligibility. <laughs> said that right to your face. Yeah. Well, I heard it. Wow. I'm not lying. Yeah. So that's extortion. I mean. That is extortion. Yeah. But I was going to say something else. You know. Everybody has their own breaking point, and I just think that's the only answer. You know, Ben Kugler is broke, um, unless he's found something recently. But he had no. I think I think it's one of those situations. You're right, where all of his sons. No, I'm no even even Brad Kugler is going broke. So I take back everything I just said. Yeah, you know, Brad Kugler had to close his business and go work start working for Joy Jendusa. He's pulling yeah, a paycheck from Joy Jen Dusa these days. Really? Yeah. And Ben, I don't know how much Ben was, you know, a multimillionaire at one point. He gave, he bought those stupid prints. Nobody ever brings those up, but that was another scam by David Miscavige. Those prints way back when he bought over a hundred thousand dollars in those prints. He's Did you see Mary that the reason ASI was selling those prints was to recoup about $30 million of LRH's money that they lost on a bad oil deal? Oh, my God. Really? <laughs> it was either a bad oil deal or a bad gold deal. And they lost tens of millions of dollars of LRH's money. And and so their bright idea was to sell those prints to recoup the money. Wow. 
Those, those Frank Frazetta paintings? Yeah. Ugh. I always hated those. <laughs> My husband ended up taking them off Ben Kugler's hands when Ben went through some hard times and, and bought them from him. And because the IRS came after Ben at one point because um, he didn't pay his he owed him money in taxes and they confiscated all those prints. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of dollars was those, and they tried to auction them off. They did not get one dime, and they gave <laughs> them back. To <laughs> that is so funny. They couldn't sell the Battlefield Earth Frank Frazetta paintings. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't. They got them back. So uh, yeah, yeah. Ben's. I mean, you know, he's trying to come back from. I know he's probably donated over a million dollars to the church and you had to declare bankruptcy and you know, that's, that's what the church That's what 40 years in Scientology earned him. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we've covered a lot of ground here. I know we've been kind of bouncing all over the place. Um, but would you be down for uh, doing another, uh, another, uh, another chat at a later time so we can cover some more stuff. We've been going for about two and a half hours right now. Sure. Um, yeah. Do you think there's other stuff we need to cover? Oh, I mean, I, I mean, there's some other stuff we could cover. I don't know if we need to. Yeah. Um, but I was just trying to think. I was trying to think of those yeah. questions. Yeah. But like, we didn't even tackle any questions, and I would feel silly doing it after two and a half hours. <laughs> Has it been two and a half hours? It's been over two. It's been okay. it's been over two. Right. Yeah. Um. And oh, so you know, here's actually what I wanted to ask you. Do you find talking about this stuff um, helpful and therapeutic, or do you find it um, unpleasant? No, I find it, for the most part, helpful and therapeutic. Yeah. Um, I still have so much heartache as regards Sam. You know, there's so much, um, too many what ifs, you know, too many, oh my God, I wish I would have just not gone back in 2005, or I, you know, um, that. But you, but other than that, it's actually, I think, cathartic. It's kind of, it always sort of helps me to unravel a little bit. You know, and I'll yeah. probably be unraveling for the rest of my life. I mean, the biggest question for myself is how could I not believe these OT level stuff? How could I be so pissed off about the, the way they were trying to get money uh, toward the end there, the 2005 to 10 or even longer, um, and still stay in, still stay in. But I, I, I'm pretty much come unravel from that, but I just, we can end with me saying this. I pretty much realized that honor stands for something. And I negated being honorable with myself. And if you do that long enough and hard enough, it's going to bite you in the butt and you could, you could pay a very big price for that. So you know, honor used to mean more in societies. Uh, but I think it's, it's people need to, uh, not just me, but a lot of people need to just be more honorable. People that are still in and stop being fearful. It's a great point. It's a great point. There's something to be said for simply not letting yourself be held hostage. Right. So what if we do this? What if we say anyone who has stuck with us and watched this whole video... <laughs> Uh, you know, because anyone can ask questions, but honestly, a lot of the questions that were asked are barely even worth answering. Um, if you've watched this whole thing, what questions do you have about what we've discussed in this video? Or what other questions uh, would you have liked us to cover that we haven't? And I'm talking about questions that are pertinent to Mary's experience or to this conversation, not general questions about L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology that anybody could answer, uh, like, like something specific to Mary's experience or what she discussed on the show or anything like that. In, in our next chat, we'll take up the questions that people have who've already watched this whole first interview. How about that? Okay, good. Sounds okay, good. Great. Awesome, Mary. No really questions. What's that? <laughs> and if there are no more questions, then we'll know we're good. <laughs> <laughs> We've satisfied it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you again, Mary. I really appreciate it. And thanks for watching, everyone. I hope this has been helpful and um, talk to you guys soon. Yeah, Bye. thanks, Aaron. Bye-bye.